take questions and comments. Um, but I just wanted to thank everyone for being here tonight. Um, for those of you that are new, uh, my name is Sarah Stolfa and I'm the CEO and Artistic Director of the Philadelphia Photo Arts Center. I wanna thank everyone for being here. Um, it's really wonderful to see our community online and expanding our community, just not in our area. So thank you for being here. Um, I also wanna thank um, for our Thursday night photo talk. So make sure you uh, connect with us either on Facebook or Instagram or our website to keep up to date. We have uh, one every Thursday at seven o'clock. Um, I also wanna thank you Kate Orlinski for um, being here tonight to share her uh, wonderful work with us. Um, after the, um, talk, make sure um, you stay engaged with PPAC, join our Facebook or our website, um, and please check out our online classes. Um, we have a great diverse range of them. Um, we'd love to see you in, in our Zoom classrooms, and um, it, please consider becoming a member or a donor at PPAC. Um, these are trying times for all of us, but I know that we'll all get through it together. Um, so thank you for being our community. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Lori Wazelchuk, who is PPAC's Exhibition and Programs Coordinator, and she will um, uh, pre proceed us through the evening. Lori? Thanks, Sarah. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Katie. Hi. We're so glad you're here. Um, Katie Orlinski is um, uh, one of the most earnest and hardworking photojournalists um, I have ever met. Uh, Katie was born and raised in New York City. She began working as a photographer um, about 13 years ago in Mexico. Um, she's photographed uh, all over the world, photographing conflict, um, nature, social issues, um, and uh, even sports. Um, but for the past five years, Katie's work has focused on climate change, exploring the transforming relationship between people, animals, and the land in the Arctic. Katie's work is frequently published in National Geographic, The New York Times, The New Yorker, Smithsonian Magazine, among many others. She has won many, uh, many awards uh, over the course of her career, such as the Art Directors Club, uh, PDN 30, Vies Lepore, Vies, Visa pour la, im, la image. Can you say that, Katie? Yep, just like that. Visa pour l'image. Thank you. <laughs> Pictures of the Year International. Um, she was awarded the 2016 Getty Images Grant for Editorial Photography. She was the 2016 Paris Match Female Photojournalist of the Year. She received a master's degree in journalism from Columbia University and in 2018 was a visiting professor at the Sneedon Chair of Journalism at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. Uh, Katie has been working and, and doing everything she can to continue to document communities in um, Alaska. Um, uh, I highly recommend if you're not already following her on Instagram to keep in touch with her work. It's important. She shares really valuable information and keeps us up to date on what's going on um, in, in the Northern Hemisphere and in the Arctic. Um, uh, and I guess I'm just gonna say welcome Katie. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this talk. Thanks, that's great. There's uh, so many people here. That's fantastic. This is the biggest Zoom I've ever done. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. Uh, I wanna make sure, and just let me know that it's working. Um, are, we, are we there? Looks great. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I'll just show a couple of happy dog photos to start this off. Um, so I had been, uh, um, Kind of what Lori mentioned, I'd been working uh, internationally. I'd been covering a lot of issues in Latin America and uh, particularly the drug war in Mexico for about five years. And, um, and I did some work in the Middle East and I was completely burned out and sort of uh, at this place where, you know, I was feeling a little bit disillusioned and didn't know what my next project was going to be. I was having, I was having a hard time. And then it was sort of like this moment of, um, this moment of fate and I got this random assignment to go to the Yukon of Canada to photograph a thousand mile dog sled race called the Yukon Quest. And um, I'd never been up north before, um, you know, I'd never, I'd born and raised in New York City, I wasn't exactly the most outdoorsy person. Um, and I got there and it just blew me away. 
I was uh, completely captivated by the landscape. Um, I love the sport. I still love the sport. Um, and the people that I was meeting, and it was something that was really interesting because up until then I cared about climate change, but more sort of as this, as an issue that was kind of this far away thing that I didn't quite understand. I didn't think I was going to see in my lifetime, but I still cared about it. It wasn't uh, tangential and it wasn't right in front of my face. And then when I went to Alaska and um, to the Yukon and to the Arctic, um, it just, it affected everybody. It was like every story there is a climate change story. It affects everyone's life, even, you know, from indigenous people, which is what the majority of my photography is about, to people like these mushers where they used to be able to keep their uh, dog food frozen all winter long and they need enough dog food for a hundred dogs and now it's melting because their outside sellers can't stay cold enough. Uh, they can't find places to train and to run um, and then the roots are getting more and more dangerous. And so, um, and then this is, uh, I'm just showing these because just to fit them in. So this is uh, when the dogs get tired or for whatever reason they want to drop out from the race, um, they send them home in the airplane and so that they don't get scared, they put them in these sacks. And so I kind of fell in love with the North after this trip and really wanted to go back and to start doing work documenting climate change. Um, and also just be in these incredible landscapes, especially as somebody from New York City. I hadn't, I never felt so small and um, just in awe of the wilderness there. And I feel like sometimes in places like these big cities, they make you feel big and you feel like everything's at the center of the world. And out there, you just remember how tiny and insignificant us humans are in the grand scheme of things. So um, Really pretty recently on when I first started working there, I got my first assignment for National Geographic um, and I was going to photograph this uh, Inupiat community that relied on subsistence hunting of seals. And um, because of the sea ice melting early and because of the temperature getting warm, this was their, their hunt was being challenged. And it turned out their hunt had been so challenged that the seals just didn't even show up that year. So I was really at a loss um, as of what to do but it also turned out that it was the fastest spring thaw in history that they had recorded. Um, so between the months of May and the months of June, um, the way that the ice went and the snow went happened faster than normal. Normally it takes about two, two and a half months, and this time it happened in a matter of weeks. So these are some images sort of documenting just about a three week period, um, one between the other. This is in Kotzebue, um, which is a community in Alaska. This is the town that Obama visited when he made his big Alaska trip. And so, um, and I like to show this a lot to my students as well to just say, you know, you kind of always have to come back with something when you get sent out on an assignment and if what you went there to do didn't work out, um, you know, sometimes you can think of a, of a different project and come back with something else. And so um, a lot of the work that I was doing is um, looking at subsistence hunting and climate change. And so in Inupiat communities, this is um, Ukiavik, it used to be called Barrow. It's the northernmost town in the United States and, um, and it's a whaling village. So they still rely on marine mammals. They don't have, um, they can't exactly grow crops or have chickens out there. So, um, you know, they, uh, hunting is a big part of their culture and uh, the food that they hunt needs to last them for the entire year. All they have is this short window in the spring where they can get all these animals and then they need to store that. So um, it was really incredible to document um, this thousand year old tradition. And, um, and it's also difficult. And so there'll be some difficult images like this. Um, and uh, you know, it's definitely not in, um, in my place to judge them. I, I eat meat, but I eat meat that comes from a package, um, an anonymous package and you know, and they, and they hunt their own food. Um, and, you know, they say prayers and it's sort of like their whole world revolves around this whale. Um, but regardless, it's really, it's really intense. Um, it's really intense to witness things like this. But, um, but I also, it was really also nice to see how respectful they were of the animal after the hunt. And um, the whole community comes out to, to uh, butcher the whale because it's basically one ton of meat. So, you know, it takes somewhere between 24 to 40, uh, 36 hours to haul all of the meat away, get it into town and get it into these ice cellars. So this is a ice cellar that's dug into the permafrost. And um, permafrost is a layer of continuously frozen soil underneath the ground. Um, 
that's been frozen for tens of thousands of years, uh, basically since the Pleistocene era. And something that's um, really scary about climate change right now is that permafrost is starting to thaw. Um, and this means that these ancient ice cellars that people use up there to keep this, the meat cold um, and to keep it safe for years, because they don't know if they might have a bad hunt the next year and rely on it, um, those are melting and thawing and becoming destroyed. So that's a pretty big issue for communities out there. This is one of those ice cellars. And, um, and another issue is um, bears are hungry because uh, they're having a really hard time hunting seals out on the sea ice, which isn't freezing up like it used to. So the, the bear, polar bears can't get their seals. So more and more they're coming into town um, and they want to eat from the scraps of the whale. They want to they get into garbage dumps. And this is not, this is dangerous for people, sure, but it's really dangerous for the bears. Um, you know, because they have children running around and if a bear comes too close, the bear will get shot. And so this is a bear that had eaten, um, they make traditional canoes out of seal skin. And so this was a bear that had ended up eating one of their canoes and came into camp. And, um, and it's the younger um, teenage bears that are particularly bold. This was one of them. Um, this is a really, really amazing moment. Um, this was also, this was a teenage bear. And, um, and I, think, I think this has happened twice to me while I was there and uh, the first time my first instinct was to protect my camera, not to take the picture. And I was like, no, and it's like, I have to get this photo. Um, and then just fortunately, I can't believe it, but it happened again. Um, so I was able to make this image. And uh, so this is a little girl who's um, she fish fishing. She didn't catch those two giant fish next to there, but she's still participating. And that's something that um, I found was really interesting going on in a lot of the communities in Alaska, which is, uh, Traditionally, these hunting practices were gendered um, with women doing, you know, more of the cooking and the processing of the food and the men going out to hunt, but they're losing these traditions um, just because of modernity and, uh, and climate change making it more challenging to do them, but also the same things that, you know, keep kids indoors all over the world, phones, TV, things like that. So um, they, and these are very, very precious um, knowledge sets and skills. Um, and the, some of the last elders that still speak the, the native languages, this is the generation in which they're losing them. So they're pretty um, adamant about sharing this knowledge. So it doesn't actually matter anymore whether you're male or female. So you'll see female whalers, female whaling captains, um, little girls going out to hunt. And I thought that was something um, really interesting and um, really nice to see. Yeah, so this is Robin after she got a seal. And this is another young hunter. And so what was interesting about this is, um, this was that winter or that summer when it was supposed to be seals that people were finding um, and the walrus came out instead. So the seals weren't even there and the walrus were out two months early. Um, so that was, yeah, that was just completely different. So you know, for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years, um, the people who have lived up in the Arctic and understood the way that the landscape changed and that the weather worked, they don't understand it anymore. They can't predict what's gonna happen. So it's just, um, you know, they don't know when the ice is safe. So these things are all kind of coming to a head now as everything is rapidly warming. Oops, it's a double. Um, I can just pause for a second and see if anyone has any questions. Okay, I'll continue. Um, so this is a cemetery for the whaling captains and the whaling captains' wives. And so um, and you can see on the edge there, uh, the cemetery is made out of uh, the whale bones. And this is a snow wall. So in the winter, um, when there's big storms, they can get sort of this influx of snow that could avalanche the entire village. So they need to surround themselves with these walls. And now this is another, um, another story that I did. This was a story I did for National Geographic specifically about permafrost. Um, and that came out in the September issue. And so I don't know if anybody's been to Fairbanks, um, but this is sort of like the Fairbanks drive through or like the Fairbanks drive in movie um, in the winter. So, um, permafrost is thawing across the Arctic, and when it thaws underneath lakes, um, it releases methane bubbles. So you can punch a hole 
in the lake and light it and see sort of this incredible explosion. Um, but this is also just a way to illustrate um, what's going on with permafrost thaw. So permafrost, um, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, and I might mention it a bit later, but within permafrost, which has been around for tens of thousands of years, is tens of thousands of years of organic matter, which when it thaws and it's released, is going to release uh, CO2 and methane. So it can be really damaging uh, and sort of create this negative feedback loop of global warming when uh, it starts to thaw even more dramatically than it already is. And so this is Gyavik. And this is another community point lay. These are herring. And that's another snow wall on the right there. And this is another community point hope. And um, this is a mini feast before the big feast. So when, after whaling, uh, the whaling season time is over, uh, the successful groups will kind of hold these events. They'll cook a lot of the meat and um, invite everybody in the community to come and get a plate. And then they have a much larger celebration one month later where they disperse all of the whale and they have kind of a lot of these traditional games like this is the blanket toss. So they make uh, a trampoline essentially out of uh, seal skin and people jump up on it and throw uh, candy and kind and furs that they've made and other gifts to people. And so this is another community that I worked in recently, uh, New Talk. And I don't know if anybody's um, heard about them. They're in the news a bit because they're the first uh, village that is going to relocate as a result of climate change, directly as a result of climate change, and they already have begun. So about half of the community has already moved to Murtarvik, another town site. And so I think you can see in this image um, the permafrost cliffs there. So the, the two rivers converged, and, um, and due to erosion caused by storms, but also permafrost thought this, uh, this village is thinking rapidly. So it won't even be sustainable for anybody to live there in, in the next four years, and they're already beginning this relocation. And um, so they use wooden walkways um, instead of roads because the roads crumble. It's not even worth it to build them. And these were four boys going on a um, bird hunt. And so these are some of the, the what's the word that you use again for there? You, stilts that you people would build their houses on, but they're taking down some of the houses because they were just deemed too unsafe. Um, and so these communities are um, really far off the grid um, and they don't have uh, much access to resources. And I was pretty shocked to see the conditions that they were in, in, um, you know, in the United States. And so this is their, um, this is where they, their water refinery it's ancient, it's so old, um, their water is terrible. Um, so part of it is uh, the community is sad to have to move and you know, leave a place that they, that they know well behind, but they want good water and they want better electricity and they want all of those things that they're gonna get in the next village. So it's, it's kind of a bittersweet situation, but um, they don't have uh, flush toilets, they don't have regular plumbing. So people there use honey buckets, which is, exactly kind of what it sounds like. And so this leads to um, health issues if there's floods because people will pour the buckets into the river and then floods will come. And so, um, yeah, so there's really isn't proper sanitation uh, throughout this community and they're doing the best they can, but they have to wait for a barge to come to pick up their trash. And sometimes it just doesn't come for months. Um, this is Callie. She is collecting goose eggs. This is one of the subsistence foods that uh, comes in uh, sort of in June in the summer. And then um, her older sisters had um, got their first ptarmigan. So all the women had a celebration where they were throwing candy and giving, giving gifts away to each other. And so I think as you can see here, how this house is up on, up on these stilts because of the permafrost. And um, Something very interesting about uh, native villages in Alaska is before, um, I'm not even sure what you call, but I guess before colonization, um, they were more nomadic as people and they would sort of have winter grounds and spring summer grounds. And, um, and then when they began doing this boarding school practice where they kind of would, they would take uh, kids away from their families and send them off to boarding schools, um, 
finally that was um, outlawed and it became legally mandatory to build a school in every Alaskan village, no matter how small. So there could be eight people in that community and they get a, a full school. So, um, and so one of the reasons why they were able to move and were only were able to get the federal funding is because the school started breaking down um, because the permafrost under the school. And, and it's just very interesting because there's, you know, there's some communities that are dealing with the exact same thing New Talk is, but because of logistics, because they can't prove that the school um, needs to be fixed or something like that, they're not going to get the funding to make this move because it's all sort of part of the, this compl complicated bureaucracy. But also is good to note that um, they didn't choose New Talk as the site where they wanted to live. That site was chosen for them. So when they were relocated by uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, they chose the site because a barge could arrive there. So, you know, I think sometimes people will say, well, you know, why, why live on the coast in such a precarious location? And, um, you know, not only did, yeah, they didn't choose to be a part of the United States to begin with, but um, they also didn't choose this location. So it is pretty traumatic um, for them to have to once again move. And then, so this was Monica. She's already um, living in Mertarvik. She's one of the first people who, who made the move to the new village. And I was supposed to be there this month working. Um, I was also gonna be doing a workshop with kids there. I don't know, there's a lot of images of kids there. They're incredible. Um, they were so eager and so smart. So I really hope next year um, we can get back there. Cause something really interesting about these villages is that um, during uh, the Spanish flu, indigenous communities in Alaska were decimated. Um, it hit them incredibly hard. They lost almost 50% um, of their population. And so when coronavirus started, um, they locked down. And it was really incredible to see. And they've kept themselves extremely safe, but they're such vulnerable communities. They're airplane rides away from hospitals. So nobody's going to be you know, visiting them from the outside anytime soon. Um, so now we're back in Alaska. This is the Brooks Range, um, and this is the Alatna River. We did a story on the Alatna River about how, um, as a result of climate change, uh, a lot of animal species are moving north, and one of those are beavers. And so they're changing the landscape completely in the Arctic, and that is another thing that's having an impact on permafrost thaw. Um, because as we all know, you know, beavers create ponds, they create meadows, and they create these spaces which are going to cause the ground to heat up faster than it was before. So beavers could be sort of, beavers can really be, make a big impact on the entire planet with the stuff that they're going to be doing in the Arctic in the future. And so this is the, this was the main image that ran in the National Geographic story about permafrost. This is the Bodagaika crater in uh, Bodagai, Siberia. And so I can't quite remember, I think it's almost about a mile long um, and it's over 300 feet deep. And, um, and it's, a, it's a thermokarst depression or a mega slump is what people call them. And so it essentially, uh, they clear cut a lot of trees in the 1960s. And uh, as a result, the ground beneath it thawed so rapidly, um, the permafrost beneath it thawed so rapidly that it created this massive crater. And it's, um, it's really impressive. And uh, in there, you'll see bones, um, you'll see mammoth bones, uh, it's, and just sort of 10,000 years of history on that wall, like what you're looking at. And, um, and people are studying places like this to try and you know, learn and get clues from the past just to sort of inform what we understand about how the planet is changing now. And this is one of those people, this is a Russian scientist, Sergei Zimov. He's, um, he's as eccentric as he looks. And um, so he runs a Arctic Research Center in Chersky, Siberia. And he also has founded something called Pleistocene Park. So the idea is, um, and this is his son, Nikita. So together they run this park. And um, the idea is that one of the ways to slow down permafrost thaw is to recreate the ecosystem of the Pleistocene era, which was dominated by large mammals like woolly mammoths and grasslands. And um, having these mammals um, kind of maintain the right kind of vegetation that keeps the earth cool and would keep and could, could slow down permafrost thaw. So they have sort of a little bit of an experiment going on in this stretch of land um, that they have in Siberia. And they kind of 
call it a theme park, but it's definitely, you know, far more ragtag than that. But they've gathered a lot of wild horses, uh, yaks, um, moose, and, you know, they're trying to get bison from Mongolia. It's, um, it's like, it's really a fun and wacky and crazy project. And then they also are, um, the idea is that if, uh, you know, George Chirks or whoever the folks are at Harvard that are trying to clone the woolly mammoth, if they ever succeed, it has a home here in Pleistocene Park. And so this is another view of permafrost at the Bodagai Crater. And some bones that you can find. And uh, similar to Alaska, the communities in the Siberian Arctic or the Russian Arctic are also dealing with um, various issues from climate change. And so they also rely on subsistence um, and hunting and fishing. And so they're being challenged as, um, as all of these uh, rivers are changing and their makeup's changing and the animal species that they have in there are changing as a result of it getting warmer, but it's particularly uh, because of permafrost thaw. And this is another family that lives out there. And here's an ice cellar, a Siberia style ice cellar. That's it. So thank you. I don't know if anybody has any questions. There are a few questions in the chat. Um, Great. And I'm gonna start, I have one because it's more, more recent, but um, it, 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 the park, the, the theme park, is, is that based on science or is that just based on his? Yes. It's based on science. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so he's, he's definitely, he's probably one of the world's like most foremost uh, permafrost scientists. Cool. Well respected, um, but it, it, and some people say, you know what, like, is trying to create a uh, woolly mammoth theme park any more crazy than trying to change um, the fossil fuel system that exists across the planet. So, you know, maybe we need crazy solutions. We need them all. Yeah. <laughs> so Holly Brown asks, how far above the Arctic is this? Is Chersky? Mm, I think, I so, think but... it's, I think it's around the same um, line as Fairbanks, if that makes sense. So it's like, it's not, it's maybe it's almost subarctic, Arctic, subarctic. Yeah. Okay, and Patricia asked, do they, do they, and this was during the, the, um, the Nutuk village mm -hmm. work, uh, do they still practice their native religious rituals? Um, I think so, yeah. And so um, they all, they practice Christianity. Um, almost most um, indigenous people in, in Alaska are Christian or Catholic. And then, um, but I think the connection between hunting um, and Christianity is, is very, they're very intertwined. And so I think that's where um, sort of their, their native religions come into play, is sort of the relationship with food, um, with food and religion. But they're, they're, they were all um, made Christian. Hmm. Or nothing it, right now, but that's, it's definitely a big, a big part of, of, of villages out there. Um. And Kara uh, asked, and then after that, I want to open it up to everybody. Kara asked, um, are those whale bones that the girl was sitting on? I don't, I don't. Yes. Uh, yeah, those were. Yeah. Um, and I want to open it up to people. If you have a question, you should feel free to unmute and just speak directly to Katie. But there's a couple more comments. Um, I loved your pictures. Could you explain your process when you are taking pictures of people? Your images were captivating. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think um, I, I'm not really a, a sneaky photographer, um, especially, you know, I'm going into places where I'm obviously not from there. Um, so I, I meet people and I chat with them and I ask them and I get their permission um, and just sort of wait around long enough um, for them to feel comfortable. And I think that's when I get good images, but um, try to make it a give and take, you know, have a good conversation, spend some time together um, in order to make images with people. How, how long do you spend, um, how, how long are your trips? So new, the New Talk trip was actually, um, I think it was 10, 10 12 days. Mm -hmm. And that might not sound like a long time, but it's a long time out there. Um, <laughs> they do not have resources, uh, you know, so I'm staying in the school, I'm sleeping on the floor in the school. Um, I've, I've brought all my own food um, and uh, 
and you know, people's homes are not big enough to, to keep me in their homes. There's also um, you know, sort of complicated issues with working with one family over another and staying with one family over another. And you don't really wanna cause problems because sometimes people will think, oh, you're paying them um, even though I'm not. So it's always best, you know, to sort of stay in the school, but it's not comfortable, so. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I think, um, in Siberia, I was there for two weeks. Um, and I think a nice amount of time um, anything less than 10 days is always, I always feel like it's too short. Um, and up to three weeks, I think is a nice amount of time to kind of work on a, on a story and then, you know, leave and go back. I've been back and forth to Alaska for six years, but, um, those are the kind of nice chunks of time I find when I'm out in the field. I'd like somebody else to ask a question. If anybody out there has anything, I've got lots more, but I'd like to Katie. hear from other people. Katie. Yes. Hi. 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 Karen Jacobson here. Um, how close were you to that polar bear? I am like in love with that polar bear. He's amazing. Um, in, he was, I was in the front seat and he was on the windshield. What? Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> oh, can you show that slide again? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Let's get back there. There we are. Oh my God, you and were, now what is he on, the car? Yep, he's that's on. the car. Um, so that's, that's him checking car. out the car. He's just curious, um, you know? Wow. Curious, but you, um, but- you weren't frightened or? Oh, I was definitely terrified, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just was like, I just knew that I had to get the picture because I'd had another experience um, before and just didn't know, you know, it's, it's so hard to even get out to this community. This community, Kaktovik, um, is, um, yeah, super far out there in the Arctic. And uh, they have this large bear population that's, that's coming every year to eat from the boneyard to the point where they've developed a bear tourism industry around it, which is complicated and weird and controversial. So um, even just being there every day is so exorbitantly expensive just to be in this community as an outsider. It doesn't matter if you're a journalist or a tourist. Um, it's the same, it's the same difference. So, you know, you get maybe like two days there before I, I have to go. So I was very happy to get this picture. May I ask a question? Hello? Hi. Um, hi. Um, have you gone during the heart of the cold season? And if you have, what do you do to keep your cameras from freezing up? Yeah, so I lived there. Um, I, so I taught at the university um, in Fairbanks. And um, so I was living there throughout the winter two years ago. Um, and then all of that dog sledding stuff is in the winter. Um, so I keep you, like, I think you keep it in your coat. Um, when it's really that cold, I'll keep it in my coat and just pop it out and put it back in. Or you leave it out, you know, you leave it out and like kind of, keep your batteries on your body and you're constantly, you know, and you're just changing your batteries. But sometimes it's so cold that the mechanics won't work. And that's when you have to do the coat thing. The problem is, is that it'll, it'll fog up the minute you change temperatures. So you have to, you know, so ideally you would just leave it outside the whole time, but keep your bot, keep your camera, camera batteries on you. I also tape hand warmers to the outside of the camera, but your phone is dead in a heartbeat. There's no using phones. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, uh, Ron Goldstein asks, where else on the globe is, is the environment similar? And Ron, if you have any clarifying parts of that question, let me know, or just ask it. Is um, the environment similar to Alaska or to? I'm not sure what, that's what I wanted Ron to clarify. Yeah, go well, ahead, Ron. Of where have you been, Katie, that the environment that you've experienced in Alaska has similarities, Mongolia, Siberia, et cetera. Yeah, or I mean, all the yeah. Different. Mongolia, Mongolia feels different, but definitely, I mean, it's, you, you could be in the same place, um, especially that area, Chersky and an area like Fairbanks. Um, they were so similar, just even in the summertime, just sort of the trees, the look of it, um, the flowers, the same kind of flowers. And then, um, and the, and the cultures are so similar. And when you look at, you know, when you look at a globe, as opposed to a map of the world, you see these Arctic countries are so close to each other. Um, 
they, you know, they make, they all have such similar cultures and they, you know, and they, that's because it is the same culture at this, you know, at some point, you know, all of the different indigenous cultures weren't divided up by countries. So you'll really see so many interesting similarities with, with Arctic countries like Greenland, Russia, um, and the United States and Canada. And, um, you know, I've focused a lot on Alaska, um, especially just because it's, it's helpful for, um, you know, for publishing work in the United States, that it's in the United States. But um, I'd love to do some more work, um, some more work in Russia and Canada. Thank you. Um, I have a two-part question. Um, what kind of research do you do before you travel to your assignments, I would imagine, the site, she says, um, or he. And then the second part is, what are you not showing about life and the conditions that people live in? Um, those are great questions. Um, the first one is, oftentimes, these kind of stories start from um, me, from a personal project, or from me working on grants, getting grant proposals, um, and doing tons of research to get sort of some seed funding to go do it. Mm -hmm. And then the assignments will come, but it's oftentimes, you know, people don't, people aren't gonna send you to something that they haven't seen you shoot before. So you kind of have to do the work even before you get the work. Um, so you get, you know, so editors and publications will associate you with the place. So, you know, I'll have done tons and tons of research before I worked on grants um, and been there before then I start getting the kinds of assignments that send me back. But then when I get an assignment, um, yeah, I mean, research and also I'll try and see who else has been there um, as far as photographers and journalists, because, you know, everybody seems to, you know, it's a nice community and people help each other out. And then um, what I find in definitely in places like Alaska, um, it just, and, and Siberia, you know, and like plans don't work. It's very good to research and, and you know, read and know about the place, but, you know, trying to contact people in advance is, is generally pretty, pretty useless. And, you know, everything will just happen once you get there and you have to have some faith. And then the other question is what I'm not showing. And that's something that I struggle with a lot because um, this project, I wanted to focus on climate change. And there's a lot of other issues that go on in the communities in Alaska. Um, there's a lot of domestic violence. There's a lot of suicide and just in general, a lot of social problems. And what's interesting is that in the communities that have a very strong relationship with nature and like that community Ukiavik that I showed you that, um, that hunts with the whales um, and then a few others, um, they're healthier, you know, and they still have social issues, but those communities have, um, you know, it, it's sort of, it's good for the kids and it's good for families to be involved in these things. Um, so that's something that's really important. And, um, but there's so many people that aren't actually necessarily, you know, holding on to these uh, customs and are, you know, not doing so great. And I'm not meeting them when I'm out there, you know, they're inside, they don't want to talk to me. So I'm not telling their story, but there actually was um, uh, one of the Pulitzers just got awarded to a friend of mine who works for the local newspaper in Anchorage. Mm -hmm. And he did a story about the lack of police in so many communities in Alaska and how um, there's so much sexual violence that never gets reported. And, um, you know, and it was, it's a really hard story to do. Um, so it's, you know, I'm really glad that there's um, people in Alaska that are sort of focusing on more of the social issues in the communities, not just the environmental issues. Um, as a follow-up question, um, uh, uh, she says, I was thinking more in lines with the social historical framework of the pe people. I think she's talking about, um, uh, I'm not sure. Would you like to follow Like boarding school legacy or, or intergenerational trauma? Um, is that sort of what they were? I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, let me jump in. I'll, let me, um, what I was thinking of more is kind of from a visual sociology perspective. Uh, before you go into an area, you really you really ground yourself in the historical, political structure of the community, from religion to economics to the struggles they're having, the conflicts. I mean, um, one of the problems in National Geographic historically has been they present these neutral pictures. They use red a lot, um, and they really don't get into the, the the struggles of the people they're photographing. They look nice, right? They look pretty. But I mean, I think, you know, you have this wonderful opportunity to go in and really explore the, 
the real essence of that community and the struggles of the people. Mm -hmm. That's my thought. Okay. I like your work. I mean, that's not the question about the work. It's how does one prepare oneself to go in and why do you go there? Um, you know, it's not just about assignments getting published. Actually, there's some issues or interests that drive you. Just like anybody doing street photography or other kind of work, there's some kind of passion or uh, curiosity that drives you to do it. Yeah, I think for me, it's just, um, you know, the environment and climate change is, um, it's, it's, it's something that you don't see a lot of intimate imagery about. Um, there's not a lot of faces to it. And um, we know that that's what makes people care is when they can relate to a story, you know? So something that um, I just really work on is to work with and, you know, meet people and develop close relationships and, and document their life. So that's what, um, you know, that's what I'm doing in New Talk. So I'm really excited to go back there and to just sort of see what it's like to be, you know, to be these famous climate refugees, you know, what is it really like? Um, I think one part of it is that um, the kids were really excited to be getting a, a playground. They didn't have a playground, you know, and I think, you know, I think sometimes you might want to go in there and talk, tell this sad story about this village that's, you know, being ripped away from their roots when in reality, actually, all the kids were really pumped. They really wanted that playground. And I think that's interesting. So, um, so yeah, you know, just trying to, trying to see the truth and tell the truth and tell people's stories as best I can. And, you know, for me, I like that it's beautiful there, but that's something that is challenging um, when there's a lot of dark social issues going on and, um, and there's, you know, a lot of beautiful photos and how do you sort of, where do you find the balance between that? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna read Holly's um, comment. The passion of the people most definitely comes through in the photos, even if it was not the intent of the project. She says, uh, I might argue, despite the topic of climate change, you get really captured the passions of people. Thank you. Anybody yeah, I mean, to them, it's real, it's everyday life, you know, like just this, you know, it's warming so fast. They're seeing everything change before their eyes, but it's also their daily life, so. I want to talk a little, I mean, I follow you and um, when you post the photos of the permafrost, you know, the, the drastic changes in the permafrost, I, I, it becomes, it, it kind of inspires a lot of um, worry, but uh, it also makes me um, wonder how much um, you are learning from the scientists you work with. I mean, I feel like it must be such a gift to be walking alongside um, these scientists that are working on these critical issues. And, um, and uh, I don't know, I, I feel like it must feel like an honor to be able to um, illustrate their work and communicate their work. I mean, absolutely. And it's a challenge, you know, because this is, it's not, I'm definitely an, an art kid. So, you know, trying to wrap my head around science, it took me forever to even just understand what permafrost was when I got this assignment. Um, and I also have to thank the writers that I work with because that's what they do. You know, I know, I know how to tell the story in pictures, but they know how to translate this kind of dense science that, you know, might not make sense or appeal to most people into these compelling stories. So it also feels really lucky that not only am I getting to, you know, meet firsthand and work with these scientists, but also I have sort of like a translator there because I have the writer with me. <laughs> May I ask another question? Sure. Um, I'm fascinated by the whole climate change stories. And uh, you know, I've heard stories like at a certain point, half of Florida will have to vacate because the waters will rise from the melting um, icebergs in Alaska. How far south is climate change obvious? In other words, how far below Alaska, if, if there is, or below Siberia, or below, when will people right. pay attention to worry? Because if they don't feel it yet in, in um, I don't know, in Florida, or I, I'm just looking for what's going to... What I am too! I'm looking for that too. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, we see with, we see it with coronavirus and that, you know, if something, something became so immediate that, you know, we stopped, we stopped the world, we stopped the economy for it. That's huge. 
you know, but, um, but what would it take to, to get, you know, the, the even larger existential immediacy of, of climate change to kind of to, to garner that kind of a reaction from, uh, from governments and from businesses. And, you know, that's sort of, that's the big challenge is just trying to communicate that. Um, and the urgency to, to communicate the urgency without depressing people is also challenging. So that's something a lot of um, these new stories that I'm kind of working on have to do with solutions um, and a lot of the solutions and sort of climate resiliency. And a lot of a lot of scientists are now looking at things that they used to say, you know, things that were like, oh, th those are um, like those are old time traditions are, you know, they're now realizing are kind of the best way to, for people and the environment to work together. So I'm looking at some of positive stories um, just because I think, you know, I think it's just such a fine line if, with getting people to care without just getting them to be kind of fatalistic about it. But I didn't really answer your question. <laughs> I, I just wondered, I mean, yeah, obviously, some people saying, you know, the, the winters are not as, as, as severe or where uh, yeah. the summers are hotter. Uh, or, but where is the water rising, perhaps? Like as if, you know, as if we're talking about a bathtub, right? We're somewhere, because we are, I mean, on the planet, it's what, it's what you're seeing, you know? So as, as the, you know, the sea ice melts and there's more water, you know, it's, it's going to affect oceans in Europe. So there's sort of these um, these very very far flung connections between what's going on in the Arctic and other things that are going on in the rest of the planet, but um, but the science isn't there yet to say categorically this is related to that. But as far as in Alaska, up to the point of even where sort of Seattle is, like where Juneau is, you're seeing you know you're seeing winters completely changed. I have a, a question from Elizabeth. She says, hi, Katie. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. I'm typing because my husband is playing drums loudly in my background. <laughs> I'm wondering how you keep yourself from burning out on these very big topics. You mentioned that a little bit at the beginning of your talk, and I wonder how you cope and keep going when it gets overwhelming. Yeah, um, I think um, one of the things was um, photographing those dogs in the beginning. I do that still. So um, I'll, I'll work on these sort of stories about climate change and about environmental destruction. And I'll also work on stories about uh, dog sled races. So I'll try to find um, some stories that I find inspiring and that um, make me feel good and are just sort of fun. Um, but then it is, you know, it's definitely hard. Uh, sometimes you'll, sometimes you'll burn out, but I generally get obsessed. So if there's a story that I'm working on, I'm obsessed with it. So I'm not noticing if I'm burning out. And then, you know, yeah. And so then, then there'll be sort of like a moment of pause and they'll be like, you know, up to a year where I'm just like needing a break. Um, but uh, generally, you know, something like with this project, I just got so obsessed with it that I, you know, that I, all I wanted to do was take pictures of it. Um. I have, a, I have, a, there's another question, but I want to ask one first, because um, I, I think Sheila's is one for uh, closer to the end. Um, I remember reading one, one of your texts um, about uh, the, the wisdom and the, in, and the knowledge and the ability and the adaptation um, strategies of the First Nations in Alaska to climate change. Um, and the importance of that, um, of that knowledge and how, I just remember re reading something where you were talking about their ability to adapt and their ideas about adaptation um, present some really l good leads for the rest of the planet. Can you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Yeah, um, I mean, just their, their knowledge system. So they've, they're closer, you know, have been for so many generations so close to nature. So, you know, this maybe counters a little bit what I said before about people not knowing what's going to happen, but at the same time, they they have a closeness with the landscape and with the land that just results in so much knowledge, um, you know. And it's not, um, you know, it's not necessarily you know categorically scientific knowledge, but I, but science is now finally recognizing it as such and using it and using their stories and and their history to kind of help help you know, build these sort of plans, trying to build these like climate, climate adaptation plans. Um, and they're, uh, I mean, but then also their spirits really amazing. Like, 
um, it's, it's not, you know, they'll, they're upset by this, but they also, you know, you'll ask somebody and you'll be like, well, what will you do when like, there's no more fuel here? You know, what will you do when, you know, you know, who knows what, like you can't afford this or when there's no ice and they're like, we'll find a way, you know, we'll go back to the ways that like that our ancestors did. We'll make our canoes out of seal skin. Um, we'll, you know, we'll always find a way to hunt and to do this and to adapt. I mean, and when you really look at it, like, they've been adapt. I mean, how incredibly have they adapted just over the past hundred years? Mm -hmm. So, you know, so they have so much knowledge and so much experience with that. So that's sort of, you know, what we're seeing, but we're seeing that in Brazil and the Amazon and kind of all over the world that they're, you know, kind of finally recognizing how much uh, local people's knowledge about the landscape will inform science. Mm -hmm. Uh, a couple questions. Uh, do you uh, feed images back to the community? For example, an exhibit in the local school or community center? Yeah, well, so everybody's on Facebook. Everybody loves Facebook in Alaska. They're pretty isolated. Um, and when they would get a big hunt, they used to um, ring the church bell to let everyone know, and now they'll post it on Facebook. Um, so that's one of the ways that's really, um, really nice to be able to keep in touch with somebody. It's just I'm Facebook friends with everybody. And I'll make a set of photos for them that aren't necessarily the photos that I'm going to publish in the magazine, but, you know, that they're going to like. And then I, and I share those with them and they can share those on Facebook um, and I'll send people prints. But an exhibit would be great. And that's sort of um, kind of a, what we're, a goal that we're trying to get to with these workshops that we're doing. Um, I did a workshop in this community, Shishmaref, which is another one of the communities that's set to relocate. Um, with kids with um, with smartphones because that's what people have there and I feel like kind of it's it's good to sort of work with what people have as opposed to kind of bringing in cameras that they don't really know how to use and then um, the plan was to do another workshop in New Talk and then sort of bring um, both of the community's images together for an exhibit um, but we'll just have to wait another year for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um. Uh, thank you. So I've got. To, I'm going to read. There's a few more questions. Yeah. So they're coming. They're coming. Great. <laughs> thank you so much for your talk. When you're doing your projects, how much of the framework of the story you wish to convey is in your mind before you start taking photos versus created afterwards uh, while you're reviewing your photos in the editing process? I feel like it's um it happens there. Um, you know, I'll definitely come in with my idea. It's almost never what I my idea is. Um, you know, in the story, I'll, I'll see or I'll feel the story like when I'm there making the pictures. And then my challenge is to try and represent that through the editing process. Um, I guess that's sort of how, how it goes around. Do you, do you want me to, can I put these on a slideshow? Sure. So she wants to just... see, Holly wants to see the, the pic of the kid with the pink hair and the dog. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> um, the cool musher woman, yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, she's not a kid, she's a, she's a really woman, yeah. Um, there's two questions that are very similar. Um, Sheila asks, what projects will you be working on until you, before, until you can go back to Alaska? And then Jill asks, will you continue on this project only, or do you have other projects you are planning to work on? Yeah, no, I'd like to work on a lot of other projects. Um, I definitely, you know, I still love working in Alaska and love the Arctic, but I'm like, yeah, send me somewhere warm. I can handle that. So I'll work in other places. I just had a story come out today in the New York Times about monarch butterflies and um, the monarch butterfly sanctuary in Mexico where um, they're dealing with a lot of um, interesting issues with, um, with the area that it's in in Michoacan is a pretty violent um, drug cartel controlled state where they have um, a lot of interest in the timber and then you've got the monarch butterflies, which rely on these trees. So you've got a lot of money coming in from conservation groups, paying communities to take care of the trees. And then you've got gangs that are kind of, you know, more interested in using that land for other reasons. So there's some conflict going on there. So that's a story um, that I worked on. And I'd like to um, continue looking at issues with, with um, environmental defenders in Latin America, because it seems like this is kind of a... Um, this is a trend that the, a lot of environmentalists are kind of facing these, um, these pushbacks um, with organized crime. Uh, so that's a story I'm interested in. And then right now, um, not, I'm not too sure. I think, um, I think there's some, possibly some really, really interesting stories to tell that have to do with, uh, with COVID and how it's affecting 
the country, how it's, you know, what's happening with the environment, but then also um, other stories that I've been researching about, about food. So 